I'm terribly, terribly excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, one reason is that, um, of course, I have spoken at the Asia Society Hong Kong uh, for every single book in the trilogy, Mouth Great Famine, when it came out in 2010. And then in this very prestigious room three years ago for the tragedy of liberation. So I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me back again and again, despite all the horror contained in these books. Uh, one thing has been troubling me. Um, um, the interview that was uh, mentioned in the Sunday Post contains a number of photos of me, and um, it's the exact same shirt. <laughs> so some of you who have read it might think this man only has one shirt. But that's not true. It's probably one of my better shirts. But I do have a couple of T-shirts back home. Um, now, the Cultural Revolution spans a decade. And on top of that, as if that isn't complicated enough, I actually start my book, my account, in 1962 for reasons that will become, I hope, apparent. Um, but it seems to me important to talk a little bit also about what the good old chairman had in mind, I think, with the Cultural Revolution. So let me have a brief introduction. And then, as a historian, of course, I'm interested in periodization. This may sound rather boring, but I think it is absolutely vital that we understand that there were several periods during the Cultural Revolution, and that these periods were quite radically different. So after my brief introduction, I will talk about part one in the book, which I call the early years, 1962-66, where there was a campaign of uh, a socialist education campaign, which started, pretty much kick-started the Cultural Revolution. Then I move on to part two, the red years, 1966-68, to 68, um, with familiar images of red guards and red terror. But what follows um, has not always been discussed in detail, namely the years from 68 to 71, when the military quite literally turned this country into a garrison state. I call these the, the black years because these are the years when most of the killings actually take place, not during the Red Guards in 66. And finally, I think the last part of the book is interesting. I call it the gray years. Gray is good. It's not black. It's not red. Um, gray years from 71 till the death of Mao Zedong in 76, when ordinary people realize that the Cultural Revolution has really damaged the party itself. And in the countryside, they use the opportunity to reconnect with their own past, their own entrepreneurial past. So I claim that reform, economic reforms actually start from below, not from the top. Now, let me start with this introduction, maybe a quick anecdote. We are in the summer of 1963. Chairman Mao receives a delegation of African guerrilla fighters. And among these young visitors, there is a tall, square-shouldered man from southern Rhodesia who has a question. He notes that the red star that used to shine over the Kremlin has slipped away. And he notes that the Soviet Union is now selling weapons to their enemies when once they used to support the revolution. So his question is the following. He says, Chairman Mao, will the red star shining over Chen and Men here in Beijing also fade away? The chairman becomes pensive, puffs on a cigarette, and says, I understand your question. You are saying that the Soviet Union has gone revisionist, has betrayed the revolution. Can I guarantee to you that China will not go down the same road and betray you as well. I cannot. But we are looking for a way to do this. Three years later, on the 1st of June 1966, the People's Daily publishes an incendiary editorial entitled Sweep Away All Monsters and Demons. This is the start of the Cultural Revolution. But what exactly 
is this Cultural Revolution all about? Four people have been arrested among the top leadership, including the mayor of Beijing. He's alleged to have plotted against the chairman. People asked to stand up and denounce all those who are trying to lead China back onto the road down to capitalism. Now, few people realize who these traitors might be inside the party ranks, but one thing is very clear. The modern representative of revisionism is one man, the Soviet leader and party secretary, Nikita Khrushchev. In 1956, Khrushchev shook the socialist camp to its very core by denouncing his erstwhile master, Stalin, detailing the horrors of his reign, denouncing the cult of personality. Two years later, 1958, Khrushchev proposes peaceful coexistence with the West, which revolutionaries, true believers around the world, see as a betrayal of the principles of communism, including, of course, that young man from southern Rhodesia. Mao clearly saw the attack on Stalin as an attack on his own person. He was, after all, the Stalin of China. He must have wondered how one single man, Nikita Khrushchev, could have single-handedly engineered a complete reversal of policy in the mighty Soviet Union, which managed to defeat the Nazis. The answer was culture. The capitalists were gone after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, after the Communist Revolution in China after 1949. But capitalist culture was still there, allowing a few at the very top of the machinery to erode and subvert the entire system. So Mao's answer was to eradicate all traces of the past, to attack bourgeois, capitalist, old, feudal, superstitious culture once and for all. He called it the Cultural Revolution. But of course, there's more than it than just a strategy. The Cultural Revolution also has to do with Mao's own standing in history. Even when Stalin was alive, he viewed himself as a much greater revolutionary. It was he who pretty much brought, brought, brought a quarter of humanity into the socialist camp in 1949. And it was Mao rather than Stalin who fought the Americans to a standstill in Korea. So after Stalin's death in 1953, Mao pretty much thought that he would assume the leadership, the mantle of the socialist camp. In 1958 comes Mao's first attempt to steal the thunder of the Soviet Union with the great leap forward as he herds people in the hundreds of millions in the countryside into giant collectors referred to as people's communes, thinking that by transforming every man and woman into a foot soldier in a giant army that will work day and night to transform the economy, he will catapult China past its competitors, making him the man who leads mankind into a world of plenty for all. Of course, the Great Leap Forward backfires badly. Tens of millions of ordinary people are worked, beaten, or starved to death. Mao's second attempt to become the pivot around which the socialist world revolves is the Cultural Revolution. Here's his thinking. In 1917, Lenin was the one who led the great October socialist revolution. Now Mao will kickstart the second stage in the international communist movement with the great proletarian cultural revolution. Mao is the one who will inherit, defend, develop Marxism, Leninism into Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. Grandiose ideas, of course, but something else happening as well. Underneath all these theoretical justifications, 
There is also an attempt by an aging dictator to make sure that nobody will ever be able to remove him from power. Already in 1956, when Khrushchev denounced Stalin, a number of people, close colleagues, Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, used Khrushchev's secret speech to attack the cult of personality in China and write Mao Zedong thought out of the party constitution. But surely the biggest problem that Mao had to confront was the disaster of the Great Leap Forward as in January 1962, some 7,000 cadres convene in Beijing to discuss the disaster of the Great Leap Forward. At that point, Mao's star is at its very lowest. Rumors are circulating about how the chairman must be responsible for the mass starvation of ordinary people. Are those who accuse him of being innumerate deluded. And no doubt some of them would want him to step down. The question now becomes who will be China's Khrushchev? Who will denounce the chairman? Who will stab him in the back? Possibly even while he's still alive. What will happen to his legacy? So I think this is pretty much uh, behind the whole impulse to launch this cultural revolution. As I said earlier on, it comes in different periods. The first period starts right away in 1962. A couple of months after this conference, in August 1962, Mao is already on the counter attack. He launches a socialist education campaign. And the purpose is to make sure that all activities that take place outside of the planned economy are eliminated in 1960 in order to get out of the famine caused by the Great Leap Forward. Parts of the country side had allowed the land to be decollectivized. These practices are now eliminated. But this is not enough. Liu Shaoqi, in 1963, assumes the leadership of the socialist educa education campaign and goes even further, veering to the left of the chairman himself, claiming that up to a third of the country is in the hands of capitalist voters who have been plotting a revisionist route back to the past. Liu Shaoqi presides over one of the most uh, brutal purges in the history of the party, punishing some five million party members. And all along, during this socialist education campaign, emphasis is put on educating young people, the, the heirs of the revolution. So young people, school children, all the way up to universities, are made to read the works of Mao Zedong. A martial atmosphere is promoted by the Red Army that distributes a little red book. School children are trained to use air guns. Other students are sent to military camps over the summer. All are schooled in class hatred. From 1962 to 66, we have four years of indoctrination in class hatred. By the end of it, young people are itching to fight real or imaginary counter-revolutionaries. So when, on the 1st of June, 1966, the People's Daily publishes this editorial entitled Sweep Away All Monsters and Demons, they are ready, prepared for action. This is the start of what I refer to as the Red Years from 1966 to 68. That very same day, celebrated as Children's Day, by the way, 1st of June, 66, something else happens. A week earlier, a poster went up on the campus of Peking University alleging that the university leaders are nothing but a bunch of Khrushchev-type revisionists. Students now, in June, in July, are kicked into action. They start interrogating their teachers, trying to see if some of them might be hiding a bourgeois background or secretly harboring capitalist thoughts, or trying to undermine 
the party. But some of them go too far and criticize leading party officials. Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, are in charge of the Cultural Revolution over the summer of 1966. They send in work teams, punish these students. Mao is far away in the south, watching from a distance what is happening in the capital. He returns to Beijing by the end of July. Instead of supporting his two colleagues, Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, he turns against them, accusing them of suppressing the student movement, of trying to establish a dictatorship. To rebel is justified. Zhao Fan Yoli becomes Chairman Mao's battle cry. And rebel, students do. Within days, some of these students start donning loose uniforms, refer to themselves as Red Guards, vow to defend the chairman, declare war on the old world, and carry through the Cultural Revolution. They rampage through cities, burn books from libraries, overturn tombstones and cemeteries, tear down temples, vandalize cathedrals, and go further. Not just public property in Shanghai alone. They raid a quarter of a million households, confiscating anything that smacks of the past, whether ordinary books printed before 1949 or rare scrolls, antique bronzes, all of it destroyed. They go further. They attack ordinary people suspected of being enemies of the revolution. They take some of the teachers to task, beat them up, cover them in ink. In Beijing alone, by September 1966, over 1,700 people have been quite literally beaten to death. A couple buried alive in the suburbs of Beijing. But there is an issue here. Mao wanted the Red Guards to purify the upper echelons of the party. What they're doing instead is attack ordinary people. Of course, party leaders have honed their survival skills for decades thanks to political infighting. And they're not about to be outmaneuvered, outflanked by a bunch of screaming teenagers. They have their own strategies. They receive the Red Guards and deflect the violence away towards ordinary people. They set up their own Red Guards. In the parlance of the time, they raise the Red Flag to fight the Red Flag. Then the Red Guards themselves become confused about who the true revisionist and capitalist elements hiding inside the ranks of the party truly are. The Cultural Revolution is in danger of petering out. It's a stalemate. In the autumn of 1966, much as the chairman has inc had incited students to rebel against the teachers, he unleashes the entire population against the party itself. He asks ordinary people to denounce party members. It is a social explosion on an unprecedented scale. All sorts of social groups can now finally release pent-up frustrations, grievances built up during years of communist rule. In the countryside, all those who had to survive the Great Leap Forward. In the cities, workers, impoverished, living in abject conditions, barely able to feed their own families. And of course, all the victims of previous purges, including the five million people punished by Liu Shaoqi during the socialist education campaign. The people stand up. But of course, they don't somehow neatly sweep away all the representatives of the bourgeoisie. They become divided. They jostle for power. They have different interpretations of what Mao Zedong may have in mind. Before you know it, they start fighting each other. In January 1967, Mao intervenes again. He asks the army to intervene and support the true proletarian left. The army is divided. 
different officers support different factions. Before you know it, people start fighting each other in the streets with machine guns and anti-aircraft artillery. This country is sliding into civil war. None of it matters too much. The chairman thrives in willed chaos. He can bend and break millions. He can issue a verdict about this or that faction in this or that province, a verdict that will affect the lives of tens of thousands of people. And he can change his mind overnight, feeding a frenzy, a cycle of violence in which people become keen to demonstrate their loyalty to the chairman. These red years come to an end in 1968, when in the summer, revolutionary, so-called revolutionary party committees are established pretty much everywhere. These so-called revolutionary party committees are heavily dominated by the army. I call this the start of the black years. There are soldiers overseeing factories, schools, government units. They turn this country into a garrison state. Their first act is to send millions of people to the countryside to be re-educated, including all young students who took Chairman Mao at his word. Many of them are sent to the countryside without any fixed abode. In some provinces, up to half of these young people live in caves, sheds, abandoned pigsties, temples that have somehow survived the onslaught of the Cultural Revolution. They go hungry. In the single province of Hubei alone, thousands of young girls exiled from the cities are raped by local bullies. Some of the victims are as young as 14. From here onwards, from 1968 onwards, any student who graduates from middle school or high school sent off to the countryside. And not just students, entire categories of undesirable elements are more or less banished to the countryside, dumped there without any help whatsoever, as the countryside becomes the dumping ground for all undesirable elements. This is followed by a purge. Special committees are set up to investigate the alleged enemy links of ordinary people and party members alike. The talk is no longer about capitalist elements or revisionists. It's all about spies, traitors, renegades, anybody. Whoever had a foreign link in the past becomes suspect. In Shanghai alone, over 170,000 people are harassed by these revolutionary committees. Over 5,000 hounded to their deaths. In Guangdong, the province, just across the border, one estimate puts the death toll at 40,000. At the heart of darkness is probably in a place called Inner Mongolia, as some 800,000 people are arrested, incarcerated, interrogated, denounced in public meetings, torture, Chambers appear across that province. Tongs ripped out, teeth extracted with pliers. Horrendous methods of torture applied to these victims, who turn out to be overwhelmingly Mongol. Mongols in Inner Mongolia constitute 10% of the population but are the vast majority of victims. It very much looks like a genocide. After this nationwide witch hunt, appears a campaign against corruption, 1968, 69, some of it, all the way till 1970. The purpose here is to cow the population 
It's not about a targeted minority. It's about instilling fear in the majority. It affects one in 50 people in some provinces. This is the point where if you inadvertently poke a hole in a Chairman Mao poster, or if you somehow criticize the planned economy, you probably have committed a criminal counter-revolutionary act. The result, of course, is to, or the aim, rather, is to destroy the social fabric. Make sure that people are kept on their toes, that nobody is loyal but to the chairman himself. What happens with the economy? The very heart of the Cultural Revolution, in particular these years, resides in an industrial project referred to as the Third Front. This is a regime paranoid about warfare, Americans, Soviet Union. So the idea is to literally recreate an industrial infrastructure in the hinterland, far away from the industrial north, and far away from the provinces along the coast. Some 1,800 factories are relocated from the coast into the hinterland. Millions of people, workers, have to work in provinces like Anhui, Sichuan. Great job. It probably constitutes the single one most glaring example of misallocation of resources in the 20th century. It's an economic disaster second only to the Great Leap Forward. It's an absolute waste. Of course, the military are in charge but the chairman realizes that whoever controls the army can turn it against the chairman. Lin Biao has become powerful. He disappears in a mysterious plane crash in September 1971. This brings to an end what I refer to as the black years. The military fall victim to the Cultural Revolution. The army itself is now purged. The soldiers return to their barracks. This is the start of what I call the gray years. By now, ordinary people are exhausted by the revolutionary frenzy. They look around, in particular in the countryside. They realize that if the credibility of the Communist Party has been undermined by the Great Leap Forward, its organization has been badly damaged by the Cultural Revolution itself. Who is going to prevent them doing from what they would really like to do? In what I refer to as a silent revolution, millions upon millions of ordinary villagers quietly, surreptitiously, on the sly, reconnect with the past they quietly start returning the land to individual households. They start expanding their private plots. They open black markets. They operate underground factories. Let me give you one example. Yan'an, set amidst dusty sandstone-colored hills in northern Shanxi, a place well-known because it became, of course, the capital for Mao and his ragtag army of guerrilla fighters during the Second World War. In 1974, a team arrives in Yan'an, investigates the place thoroughly. They are shocked by what they see. There are still posters of Lin Biao fluttering in the wind. In 1974, three years after the man has been denounced as a renegade and traitor, entire villages do nothing but raise pigs in complete contravention of the planned economy. The local carders supervise the entire operation. The meat is sold on the black market, and the money is used to buy grain from the black market in order to fulfill the village's obligations in grain procurements to the state. And this is not just Yan'an. Further to the south, in Shanxi province, entire people's communes very quietly redistribute all their assets. The whole fiction of collective ownership is somehow maintained 
as farmers quietly return a share of the crop to the party officials who can then pretend that this still is a planned collectivized economy. This happens in poor regions because people by now are desperate to get themselves out of the malnutrition, starvation caused by the planned economy. But it happens in wealthier regions too. Say Guangdong, that province I mentioned earlier on, where in a county like Puning, some 30 markets already in the early 1970s catered to a million people. You can buy books printed before 1949, traditional poetry, anything that has escaped from the clutches of the Red Guards. There are storytellers with wooden clappers to mark the most dramatic moments in their stories. You can buy bicycles, grain, meat, all these commodities which are normally reserved for the state and banned from the market. You can buy entire tractors. There are gangs traveling up and down the coast of China, all the way to China, who will deliver whatever it is that the local villagers require. And it goes further. Many of these villagers reconnect with their entrepreneurial past. Before 1949, many villagers produced small items, silk hats, rattan baskets, cotton shoes, they start doing this again. They operate underground factories. Take Chuan Sha, just outside of Shanghai. By 1975, before the death of the chairman, industrial output represents about three quarters of what that entire, entire county produces. In short, even before the chairman dies in 1976, large parts of the countryside have already started decollectivization. People have gone capitalist in the parlance of the time. They've had enough. This is probably one of the most dramatic outcomes of the Cultural Revolution. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping assumes the reign, reigns of power. April 1979, he still insists that people who have left the collectives return to the people's communes. Although already by 1972, up to 60% in large parts of Zhejiang province were go it aloneers, people who had left the collectives. It's too little, too late. Deng Xiaoping tries to reinforce the collectivized economy. He can't do it. By 1980, up to half of all the land in entire provinces like Anhui, Gansu, Guizhou, is already in the hands of individual households. As usual, the people are far ahead of the party. Deng Xiaoping is clever enough to go with the flow. He portrays himself as the architect of economic reforms when in fact the true architects of economic reforms are the people. And it isn't just economic reforms. Three decades of endless campaigns of thought reform have produced nothing but skepticism even among party members themselves. Even before Mao dies, most ordinary people have been able to free themselves of the ideological shackles of Maoism. Nobody believes in Mao Zedong thought in the countryside. But of course, while ordinary people have been able to wrench back basic economic freedoms, while they've been able to substitute the dead hand of the state with their own ingenuity and initiative, their political aspirations are suppressed. Under Deng Xiaoping, the party now lives in fear of the people, afraid that they might go back to the red years of the Cultural Revolution, criticize party members, take them to task, ask for accounts. 
So the party has to suppress again and again and again. In 1989, Deng Xiaoping orders a clampdown on pro-democracy demonstrators in Tiananmen Square as tanks are sent in. The massacre that follows is a display of steely resolve and great brutality. And it sends a signal that pulsates to this very day and that messages never query the monopoly on power of the one-party state. Thank you very much. We have time for a Q&A, so please, floor is open. Thank you, Frank. That was fascinating. Thank you. I know that you focus on the past, but I'd like to ask you about the present, if I may, um, because there are some really interesting, I, I think, countervailing um, forces at work. On the one hand, you see Xi Jinping uh, drifting towards what some people worry is a cult of personality. On the other hand, of course, you can't ignore that he is the very generation that was sent down to the countryside, so he must have been greatly affected and must have great thoughts about what the Cultural Revolution did to his country. Can you talk a little, a little bit about what you see happening now in these interesting trends? Well, the good man has been called chairman of everything, I believe, by The Economist. And um, as you know, I'm a historian, and I, I find it quite hard to get my head around uh, the Mao era, never mind China today. But one thing is certain, every good dictator worth his salt will have a cult of personality. If Stalin had one, Pol Pot didn't have one, he didn't last. Kim Il-sung probably has the greatest cult of personality. Kim Il-sung was looking at the Cultural Revolution in sheer horror. Most dictators were looking at the Cultural Revolution in sheer horror. How? Could the very man who presides over this machine allow the people to undermine that very machine? Why would you want to do that? So most dictators have a cult of personality, and the, the last one here is really no different. It's really no different. It's, it comes, if you wish, with, with the job. You cannot rule through naked power alone. As Dostoevsky said, uh, a ruler must use the sword and mystery. There's the machinery of repression, and there's the myth, the image. Um, so Mao's cult of personality starts far, far back in time, 1942 already, and is well on the way by the time that Khrushchev, of course, denounces Stalin. The Cultural Revolution takes it further. That's true. Now, the other parallel is, um, refresh my memory, between, yeah, two questions. One was the cult of personality. Living through the Cultural Revolution and being a victim yes, of, of course. his own family so he, he was lived through the Cultural life. Revolution. I think that's a very good point. It doesn't really matter. Sometimes the, the fates and family backgrounds of Bo Xi Lai, whose papa was Bo Yibo, is contrasted to Xi Jinping, whose papa was Xi Zhongxun, probably the first really prominent leading victim of the Cultural Revolution in the summer of 1962. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that by the end of the Cultural Revolution, any leading party member will be convinced that you should never, ever allow ordinary people to criticize the party. So there is a great confusion here between so-called democracy and anarchy. Hence the resolve to 
constantly, relentlessly repress the political aspirations of ordinary people. I could come up, I could come up with a, a little anecdote if there's a little bit of time. In Xi'an, uh, capital of Shanxi province, in the summer of 1966, students are on strike because during the Cultural Revolution, one of the students has gone too far and has been punished by the provincial party committee. They sit in the hundreds silently on the square in front of the provincial party committee. They are on hunger strike. There are nurses. There are ambulances. Occasionally, some of these young people are carried away. Deng Xiaoping is the man in charge at that point in time. This is 1966. What do you think that very same man, Deng Xiaoping, sees in 1989? Similar scenario, a hunger strike, students, intravenous drips, ambulances. He's determined not to allow that to happen ever again. You must nip that one in the bud. That's precisely what he does. So, uh, oh, hi. So, um, so many countries have had events in their past that have been um, devastating, destructive, both to themselves and to others. Um, and countries have been able to get past them through a combination of ignoring the history or confronting the history or co-opting them into some narrative. And China's been the same with the Cultural Revolution. Um, I guess in your view, how has China been able to get past the Cultural Revolution? How has it done it? And I guess finally, how sustainable do you think that, what, that, that is? Well, it, it hasn't gotten past the Cultural Revolution. It hasn't gotten past anything at all. What the one-party state does is enforce a state of uh, enforced amnesia. There's very little public debate. There's very little, there no, virtually no museums. I remember there was one on the Cultural Revolution. Apparently, it uh, got itself into trouble recently. Uh, there's very little debate about any one of these episodes. Or well, to rephrase it slightly, in 2012, the chairman of everything made it very clear that any attempt to criticize any aspect of the history of the Communist Party or any one of its leaders is tantamount to committing the crime of historical nihilism. Now, I've checked this one up on Google. I still don't quite understand what it is, but it doesn't sound very good. And I can assure you that many of my colleagues and friends in Shanghai and Beijing, who used to work on the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, have gone rather quiet. In fact, there is an article in the New York Times uh, published this morning about a very young historian taken to court because he takes, uh, he rips apart a myth about resistance in 1941. Now, the point I'm trying to make is um, that it may possibly, uh, one may possibly try to ignore the past in the hope that it will somehow disappear in the background. Uh, let's be fair, this is very much what happened um, in Spain, after Franco, a consensus in a democracy from all parties that there wouldn't be too much looking back into the entire Franco era, that there would be a period of just moving ahead rather quietly. And you could say something quite similar has happened to many of those countries that acquired their freedom again in Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It took 10, 15 years for ordinary people to actually start reading about what had happened under communism in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary. So it takes, takes time. But it seems to me that ultimately, either in Spain or Eastern Europe or China, ultimately, people do want to know. Not only that, but people do know. They tell their children. And very frequently, when there is a major historical trauma, people do not tell their children. They tell their grandchildren. They skip one generation. It has to do with a feeling of, of shame, of feeling inadequate. But ultimately, people do remember. And people do not want this to disappear. They want to maintain that memory. And I don't think you can really go on repressing and repressing and repressing that urge to somehow 
look at the past and ask yourself what precisely happened. With your sense of history, what do you think over the next 50 to 60 years, the Chinese Communist Party, having survived and evolved as it is today, what do you think will the Chinese Communist Party be able to exist over the next 50 years, as regards the Chinese people themselves, one and a half billion people, and with the rest of the world. You know, historians sometimes do a pretty lousy job when it comes to the past, but when it comes to the future, you shouldn't really rely on them. And there wasn't <laughs> a single expert on the Soviet Union who predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union. There wasn't a single specialist of Northern Africa who predicted the revolutions in that region after a man set himself on fire in Tunisia. So don't ask historians about uh, the, the, the future. And then there is, of course, the counterpart of that. Since 1949, people have been predicting the fall of the People's Republic of China. Well, they're still waiting. Um, Nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, um, I'm always a pessimist in the short term. But as Harold Wilson said, I'm an optimist in, 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 the, long, in the long term with the raincoat. So <laughs> I'm, I'm an optimist in the sense that ultimately um, what happened during the Cultural Revolution is that the party usually damaged itself because you simply cannot force a quarter of humanity to abandon its culture uh, and conform to the edicts of a planned economy. People wish to buy, people wish to trade, people wish to, to flourish. So then from Deng Xiaoping onwards, you have this sort of bizarre dualistic approach where basic economic freedoms are more or less allowed, but political aspirations are repressed. I think equally that cannot possibly go on forever. Is it two years? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it 50? I don't know, but I don't think it will last forever. Remember 1974, if you'd be a European, 1973, you'd be a European. You'd think, oh, of course there are dictatorships everywhere around the world. Half of Europe is nothing but dictators. But then, of course, Salazar falls in 1974. Franco vanishes. Greece frees up. A lot of changes just in one single year, 74, 75. So I guess that at some point any government will have to somehow recognize that ordinary people do wish to express themselves more or less freely, do wish to assemble more or less freely, do wish to publish more or less freely. And that, to me, is unavoidable. I hope uh. you're right because China has a 2,000 year history. <laughs> of course, there is an anecdote um, about Zhou Enlai, um, I think he said this in uh, 1969 and 19, yeah. 1970. Uh, he was talking to a foreign envoy and uh, asked him about the French Revolution. So Zhou Enlai said, oh, that's, that's nothing, the scale of time, that's just nothing. We'll have to wait to decide about the French Revolution. So for a very long period, foreigners thought he was talking about 1789, but he wasn't, Deng Enlai wasn't talking about 1789, he was talking about the student rebellions in 1968. <laughs> so. uh, Frank, um, I still want to go back to the history rather than protecting the future. Um, since reading your book, uh, The Great Famine, and also uh, the, uh, the tragedy of the liberation. We know that since 1949, there has been continuous chaotic turmoil, destructions and everything, either in the industry or in the rural areas. So in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, we believe that the country 
should be in a very weak stage. But having said that, I mean, people of my generation coming of age in the early 70s, we see that the uh, Nixon went to China trying to get this new rising power to be on their side to deter the Soviet Union, and also the People's Republic uh, get the membership of the United Nations in 1971. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was that the, 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 the Western world, with the leadership of the United States, actually came closer to befriend China and gave them a lot of legitimacy, which with your books, with the hindsight of your books, seems to be something they did not deserve. So I would like to ask a what-if question. What if the United States did not do it? Well, obviously, they were left on their own. Um, would they, lacking the legitimacy, um, in the words of Hua Guofeng, two years after Mao died, he said that it actually pushed the national economy to the edge of collapse. So could... That has been a totally different uh, revolution in the overthrow of the CCP. I mean, I, 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 I just want to see if that's a what-if possibility. Well, Kissinger arrived and was, strangely enough, for somebody who believes in you know, real politic, was completely smitten by <clears throat> China. He didn't see a one-party state, communist rule. He saw some sort of Confucian past impersonated in Zhou Enlai and others. Um, he came to a country that was on its knees with a tottering old chairman and gave away just about everything without asking for very much in return, except possibly for China's intervention in the Vietnam War, which didn't quite work. In fact, Pol Pot came to power in 1975. Thank you very much. Um, so quite a disaster there. But I think a lot of it including on the Nixon side, was premised on a very basic belief. If you allow China, a dictatorship, to develop economically, then political reform will follow. That seemed to be very logical. Well, we're still waiting, I think, to some extent. I think it is Nixon himself who apparently said, at the end of his life, that um, they may very well have created a Frankenstein, a very powerful one-party state. Do you want? I, I've got the microphone. Um, I don't want to compromise you in any way, but um, you, I presume, teach undergraduates or postgraduates from the mainland at Hong Kong U, and I'm just wondering how they react to your so-called not your version, it's the version, your version of history when they've been educated in a certain way in their schools, in their universities? Well, um, when I get students from the mainland, um, they tend to be extremely bright because they're self-selected. Um, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to make a distinction between students from, say, Hong Kong or Europe or the mainland. They're, they're a, a very diverse bunch. But I think it's fair to say that the few who do come and come from the mainland are extremely committed, very hardworking, and are here for a very good reason. Um, but the key to me, since you mentioned the fact that I teach, for me, the, the key point about teaching is not to provide a narrative. To me, the key point about teaching is to give uh, students uh, at any level uh, to allow them to have Contact with primary sources. To me, that's the key. You see, in many educational systems, the idea is that you just give students books to read, this interpretation versus that interpretation, and only possibly at the postgraduate level will they finally be able to put their hands on primary stuff. But you should see the faces of students when you give them stuff you can buy from flea markets, you know, personal files of people. Now here's a file of a man who in 19, I believe it was uh, 1958, was uh, sent to Xinjiang for, to work in the Gulag for 20 years. His crime says so in the files, handwritten, beautifully handwritten. The whole thing is that picture of the man himself. Uh, 20 years because he didn't put enough water in the fertilizer and pretty much um, killed a row of carrots. 
That's his crime. That's 20 years. He comes back precisely after 20 years, a broken man. The only crime he ever committed in Xinjiang, uh, where he sent from Shanghai, was to have inadvertently broken a window pane for which he obviously uh, has to pay and confess. When you give this file, handwritten, to students, you should see their faces. You should see, you know, the, the almost, the, the magic there is when they see something that seems almost tangible, as if they can travel back into time. So as a teacher, my biggest concern is to obviously give students books written by other historians, but also make sure that they actually get to do something with the raw stuff of history. That I think is essential. We're running late. <laughs> oh. All right, you really want to ask a question, so you get the last question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. Mm. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky, um, it, but it could, be, uh, it could turn out to be serious. Um, at the same time, in asking you this question publicly, it could provide you with a protection. Have you ever worried about you possibly being whisked away in the middle of the night across the border? That's a very good question. Am I worried about some attack? Some, am I worried about my beautiful Pacific blue jaguar that it might, somebody might just key it on the... Well, somebody has keyed it, actually, but no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really that worried. No, no, I'm not really that worried. No, I, I, I feel very safe in Hong Kong. I, I think we've had a wonderful discussion. I want to thank Frank for this wonderful, uh, and thank all of you for being here. But I think what you said about primary sources really, really inspired me. Um, I'm really obsessed with oral history. Uh, I think when I was working, and what you said tonight really reminds me of my previous position with Museum of Chinese in America, um, is interview your parents. Yes. And I've done that with my parents in Anhui, not beknownst to me, the stories that they have told, and relatives. And so one of the things here in Hong Kong or at other places, and you mentioned grandparents, and my parents have become grandparents, so I think it's really important that we, all of us, and, and the Consul General just left, and he, he made a wonderful comment last time, is really we need to hear these histories. And right now with technology the way it is, and I think with all of us, I, I think it's really, uh, you know, Asian society, we're apolitical, like Frank, uh, and it's it's not about politics. Sometimes it's about the stories, and that's why um, you're a historian. Yes. I'm not a historian, but I love history. So I think the stories, uh, whether it's from my parents or my f uh, relatives in, in, in China or Taiwan or other parts of the world, mm. I think it's about the stories, and the stories need to be told, and I want to thank you for sharing with us your, your wonderful uh, your writing, and I know we'll have you back. And But before we close, I really, really wanted to ask you a question about your next <laughs> book. Because in, in, in the interview, you said, uh, you, you're, um, so I'm giving you a plug, actually, about your next book. Uh, you're, you're writing about dictators, and you alluded that, a little bit to that uh, in your uh, talk, a little uh, question. Uh, you said, you were, I'm not interested in how they come up with their image. I'm interested in how they learn from each other. And in this day and age, we, we, we have other you know, leaders or, or, or people coming up. But how did you derive uh, this topic? Uh, you're going to be profiling several uh, dictators from Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Kim Il-sung, Mao, uh, Duvalier, and uh, Ceausescu, and others. And, and, uh, uh, Holly Marie uh, for Ethiopia. So, Mangistu, how did yeah. you end up with this? You know. Well, so tell um, us about I, your next book. Well, I am interested in the in the image. Um, so it's a it's a slight misquotation in that I really do want to look at how dictators build very patiently over a very long time their image and how important it is. I don't really think you can understand, for instance. Um, the Holocaust without understanding how extraordinarily popular the image is of Hitler feeding deer from his patio in the Obersalzberg 
widely, a widely spread image. You know, Adolf Hitler, vegetarian, uh, non-drinker, non-smoker, likes animals, likes children, bourgeois, reads books. So it's important to, 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 to get these two together. But frequently we study dictators in isolation from each, from each other. And if there's one thing I've learned about Mao, um, and again, Sinologists tend to see China in isolation, is that Mao is constantly learning from Stalin, and Pol Pot is constantly trying to outdo Mao. When Mussolini appears on the balcony uh, in 1922, his keenest student is Adolf Hitler, who is very interested in how he does it. And of course, by 1935, the world has moved on. Mussolini realizes that he's a mere child compared to Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. So he writes to Stalin and says, give, give, me, give me the plans you know, of these great parades you have on Red Square. <laughs> so it's just constant learning and trying to outdo the other dictator and fine-tuning that image. And I think that is one of the keys to understanding how and why it is that to this day we still have cults of personality. Well, on that cheerful note, I want to thank you all for being with us. I want to thank Frank. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A small token of our appreciation. I hope you have not gotten the book yet. Uh, thank but you very thank much. you, Frank. And thank you all <laughs> thank for you. being with us tonight. And uh, I look forward to remember the book is coming if you're interested. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And he, uh, Frank will be signing book in the back. The, those who are lucky enough to get the 20 copies. Thank you.